Welcome back to Seek Week night number two. Last night our lives were calibrated and aligned to the heart of God as we heard the reading of the word of God in the book of Philippians and saturated ourselves in prayer. Well, tonight a few leaders from last night will be sharing some calls from Philippians that God has put on their hearts for this challenging time. And again, we will engage our hearts and minds in prayer. I will begin by sharing the call from Philippians to suffer well. Throughout the book of Philippians, you hear the call and you hear the words with joy. And with joy means when we're going through chaos and difficulties and challenges, God's word to us is to suffer well. When I think of suffer well, it reminds me of the movie Braveheart. And at the end, when William Wallace is about to go and be tortured and put to death, he lifts up his eyes and he prays, God, teach me to die well. That is the foundation. That is the truth. That is the attitude that we must carry as we know we're going to suffer and go through trials. But as we go through, we have to go through with joy to suffer well is not to give in to bitterness and hate and unforgiveness. It's not to give in and, and give out and to turn around and to throw in the towel. But to suffer well is to pray while I'm going through, to worship, to sing, to obey, to love, and to forgive. To suffer well means I'm not gonna look like what I'm going through, but I'm gonna look like what I'm going to. And we are on our way to victory. God's word for us tonight is to suffer well. There's a prayer in the first chapter of Philippians that has always resonated with me. And as I think about the times we are living through at this moment, this prayer feels particularly relevant to me. It's a prayer where Paul prays that we might have a lavish, overflowing love, a love for God that spills onto others. A love that is not simply sentimentalism, but one that is earthy, rooted in reality, rooted in knowledge of God and knowledge of His Word and knowledge of ourselves. A love that's informed by a spirit of discernment and insight. I can't remember a time where there's been more confusion in this world. Fuzzy facts, fuzzy news, who can we trust? The world is in desperate need of clarity and insight. And not just insight about lofty ideals or ideologies, but insight for practical, everyday living. Insight that will help us lead our families and the church. And my favorite part of Paul's prayer is when he says, I want all this for you because I want you to understand what really matters. In all the voices and opinions out there, all the people telling us what we should and shouldn't do, what we should and shouldn't care about, so many people are confused, even frozen. And what Paul is praying for is insight and understanding to know what matters most. The ability not only to distinguish right from wrong, but also the best from the second best. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Followers of Jesus in Orange County, I know we voted in different directions, attend different churches, and maybe even it's a painful time or confusing time for us. But I want to remind us what unites us, just as Paul did. We have one God, one Savior, and therefore one gospel and one mission that we're a part of on this earth. And even we're part of one greater church family. So in the midst of our diversity, I want to invite us to be about one thing. Following Jesus and seeing his kingdom come here in Orange County. I believe as we do that, no matter where our nation finds itself, we're going to see God do incredible things that will touch our neighbors and even the nations of the earth. There's this short statement in Philippians 3.16. It says, only let us live up to what we've already attained. I love that. 
short little idea because in this whole book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul has been talking about some of the things that we've already attained. He starts out calling the people he's writing to saints, and not just the good ones, but all of them in the church are considered holy ones, holy because they've been called by God. But they've already attained is union with Christ. In fact, Paul uses this phrase, in Christ, repeatedly throughout the whole, um, you know, the whole letter that they are in Christ and they were buried in Christ. They were, they died with Christ. They were raised with Christ. They are seated now with Christ in the heavenly places. They have oneness with Christ. They have a partnership in the gospel with Christ. And they have the spirit of Christ Jesus living in them. And in fact, it says earlier on that this spirit is living in them both to will and to work according to God's good pleasure to make them want what God wants and give them the ability to do it. Here's the thing, we don't have to create unity. We don't have to create um, life change, transformation. We just have to live up to what we've already attained. What God has already said about you, what's already true of you, the truest thing about you and me is not the suffering you're going through, it's not the places where you fall short. It's not the ways you failed or that others have failed you. It's who Christ is and that he lives in you and that he's gonna finish the work that he started in you. We just have to live up to what we've already attained. It's being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You read this when you're a young Christian and you have this great hopefulness and excitement about what God is going to do in and through your life. I am here probably to encourage you today, whether you're young or old. I've been a Christian 44 years now. And from the moment I became a Christian and read these passages, I had a hope that God would use me, my story, that I could encourage other people, especially young adults, to give their lives to Christ and serve the Lord all the days of their lives. In fact, in Philippians, Paul continues in verse 27 of the first chapter, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I find that that for me is the game changer that focus on the work God has given you to do from the time you come to Christ until the day you live and breathe your last breath, that you will never shame God's name, that you will honor him in all the things that he asks you to do, that you will be faithful to him all the days of your life. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters of Orange County, it is time to shine. Uh, this was the encouragement that Paul gave the Philippians uh, so many years ago, that he called them to, to be like stars shining in the sky, that, that we would lead the way, that we would light the path for, for those who found their path crooked and, and warped. Uh, but we do this through, he says, by, by no longer uh, arguing, no longer complaining, by seeking to live lives that are blameless and pure, and as we live in this way, we become, he says, children of God, that this idea that when people see us, they see our Father. They see the family resemblance. Uh, who do you resemble? Uh, friends, it's, it's time to shine. It's time to stand out in this time. It's time for us in Orange County to shine like stars in the sky. Uh, let us live in this way. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Pretty simple. Don't just pay attention to what you want, what you're interested in, but there are other voices and other interests in the room that we might need to be considering. And it seems that the only way to survive withstanding persecution, opposition, both internally and externally, is unity. He reminds them, says, you're united with Christ. You all have fellowship with the Spirit. And because of that, you can be like-minded, have the same love, being one in terms of purpose and spirit. He tells them all these things like, this is what you were created to do. 
the question that I had was like, okay, well, how, how are we supposed to be united? Because the way that I've seen it, especially in the churches, well, you show up and you look like us, you sound like us, and now you're one of us and we're doing this together. There's so much beauty in togetherness and connection, but I don't know if that is the definition of unity that we were supposed to be running after. You can't look like me. I'm not gonna look like you. I'm not gonna believe everything that you believe or think exactly how you think, nor will you think exactly how I think. It's impossible. There's no way. However, there is this call for us to all look like Jesus. There is this call for us all to learn more about how he thinks and operate more in that. And if we more operate more in that space, how different could our world, how different could our churches actually be? And I think it's an important question for us to consider because it seems that that's exactly what we're being called to, to set aside our own personal interests and preferences and consider someone else's as well because if they're made in God's image and I'm made in God's image the both of us in in the room mean that there's more of Christ in the room there's more of God to, to know and be experienced in the room and so how can we be a community of leaders a community of, of, of believers that find it important enough for us to pay attention to that Do nothing of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I love that reminder that as we encourage, as we are united with one another in fellowship, as as we are thinking through, uh, posturing our hearts with tenderness and compassion, uh, there's another part to all of this that we need to be aware of, and that is uh, to not only look at our own interests and how things are working out within our communities, but to actually look beyond and focus and, and pay attention to the needs and the interests of others. And I think as we navigate these times, it is so important to remember that, um, to not only focus in on the inward and our communities, but the, the outward focus that needs to be happening uh, for a world that uh, is still in need uh, of Jesus and truly understanding his love. In the beginning of chapter 2, the Apostle Paul lays out a series of commandments that pretty much gets summarized as humble yourself and his justification is that is this is the mindset of Christ that he being very nature God he had every advantage meaning every privilege in the world and he laid that down he became nothing he became a servant he entered into he, he went to be present in human likeness enduring everything that we endured including death and I think about that that being the mindset of Christ. And think about um, the stat, which is kind of crazy, is that 1.2 million youth are leaving the church every year. And the reason for that is they're not com convinced by the life that the church is living. Meaning, they're not seeing this in the church. They're not buying what we're selling. They're not, instead of seeing humility, they're seeing pride in the church. Instead of, looking out for the interests of others when they look at the church they see it as oh those are a group of people that are looking for their own interests and that weighs heavy on me church and i wonder if during the seek week i wonder if this is this may be a moment for us to get on our knees as the people of god and ask the holy spirit is there any other agenda any other ism that we lifted up above the name of Jesus out of our own interest, out of our own self-preservation. And maybe it's a time for us to repent and say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, do your work in changing me. Cleanse me again. Purify me through your fire, God. And what we see here in, in that when Jesus humbled himself, God lifted him up. And I pray that that will be us in the church. I pray that as we humble ourselves, that it will be the name of Jesus being lifted up. 
therefore God exalted him to the highest place. That there is no higher place in all of the world. That if you could get into your mind's eye right now, there, there is no higher place in all of the land, in all of the universe, in all of our dimension than where Jesus Christ is exalted. And it said it gave him the name that is above every name. That at this name that there is no title, there is nothing better than the name of Jesus, that at the very sound of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 3.20 says that our citizenship is in heaven and that Jesus will transform us into his likeness. I want to remind you who you are and whose you are, and that your responsibility as a citizen of the kingdom of God is so much more important than your citizenship anywhere else. You have rights as a citizen of God's kingdom that go so far beyond your wildest dreams that you could ever receive here on earth. We belong to something and somewhere greater than anything in this world. And so, in the midst of disappointment with the results of this election, or feeling like all your hopes were achieved, let's keep our perspective on the kingdom we will belong to for eternity. Therefore, it says in the next verse, Philippians 4.1, therefore stand firm in the Lord and live in harmony with one another. That's our command as citizens of heaven, to stand for God with deep roots, appropriate flexibility and not being swept away by the current of our culture. And it says to live in harmony with those who agree with you and those you disagree with. That's God's command to his citizens. Let's display that and the good news of Jesus' reign and rule and all that we do, knowing that our God will take care of us and will be with us no matter what happens next. You know, there's only one body to which we're called. There's only one citizenship that you and I hold to. If you and I have faith in Jesus, then we're citizens of the same kingdom, that we're united together. Even if we perceive ourselves to be divided, Christ's body cannot be divided. You know, it's from that heavenly perspective that I'm talking about that we're eagerly awaiting this Savior who is to come, Jesus himself. And I'm comforted by that anticipation you know, if that's one thing that's been a redemptive piece out of this past eight months, it's that likely many in the church, maybe you, maybe me, we've gone from passively anticipating the coming of Christ to eagerly awaiting his arrival. We are desperately seeking this Savior from out of the circumstances of this world. And, you know, that's where I'm not talking about, you know, when we set our minds on these heavenly things and we think about our citizenship in heaven that, you know, we're living in some sort of spiritual escapism. That isn't the case. But out of our experiences on this earth, in this world, we are eagerly awaiting that Savior who is to come with this incredible power. This power that Paul affirms has everything under its control. Do you believe that with me? That everything truly is under the control and power of our Lord Jesus? That no matter what may come, he can direct and guide all circumstances according to his perfect will. You know, I've said it before that I believe many are fighting for a faith in these times in which they are exercising little faith. Do you trust, according to your faith, that God really is in control of all things and can work all things according to his purposes? It says that right here in Philippians. And in fact, the outflow of that power is going to be the transformation of even our own bodies. I love in Revelation, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth that Jesus is going to bring. But here we see we'll even get new bodies. They'll be transformed into the glorious image of Jesus' body. You know what that means for you and I? It means no more threat of any virus. It means no more threat whatsoever. It means no more physical distancing or distancing from one another. For what we have awaiting us is eternal fellowship with God himself and with one another. It's going to be a glorious thing. And I'm so grateful to be joined with you, my brothers and sisters, from many denominations, from many church expressions, 
all claiming our one citizenship in the kingdom of Jesus together. See, whatever you focus on is magnified. Wherever you put your thoughts, that's what you're gonna see, that's what you're gonna feel, that's what you're gonna experience. And if you focus on the wrong thing, it'll cause anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts. And God has told us, Philippians has told us, Paul, he wrote this in Philippians 4.8. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, focus on such things, because whatever you focus on, is magnified. And God instructs us here to look at what is lovely, what is admirable, to really search for him and take that moment and to dwell on that, to dwell and recognize that he's present, that he's moving, that he's good and that he's redeeming and that he is restoring all things, especially in this time. I constantly say, God, you are ruling and reigning and you are sovereign. And the answer to this is when we do this, God promises us that the God of peace, he will be with us. He promises us his peace. Peace. And so I'm so thankful for that promise and I cling to this and I practice this and God has been so faithful to do this holy exchange. When I cry out and I take this time, he responds with this holy exchange of his peace and I'm so thankful for it. Ever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my presence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. See, Paul is writing and he's saying, hey, whatever happens, stay unified. They were going through a hard time and they were struggling. And even though the church stood strong for the gospel, they lacked unity. You see, we may be one nation under God, but let's be honest, look around, man. There's many of us that are divided between two parties and our faith cannot afford to be wrapped around a party. Our faith cannot afford to be wrapped around nationalism or tribalism. Our faith cannot afford to go on without being in unity. You see, if we're not in unity, then how can we bear witness to a world that needs hope? When we look at what Paul is encouraging the church, and he's telling them that no matter what comes against you, no matter what challenges we may face, the church must step out. See, our citizenship is from heaven. And what draws us together, though we may be uh, come from different paths and different ethnicities, and though we may be uh, different tribes and different nations, what draws us together is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is His grace. It is His mercy. And it is His forgiveness that draws us together. And we find ourselves here united in one spirit. Church, let us pray for a nation that is hurting. And only God can quench our thirst. And only God can satisfy the heart. And only God can give us rest. But it must start with us. Unity must start here. And it must start now. Church, let's stand for the gospel. Well, we're living in the middle of a war. And I gotta let you know that in the middle of war, a warrior, a trained warrior understands that whatever happens to the right or to the left, they are to continue to stay on mission unless they have other commandments from their chief commanding officer. I gotta let you know that right now we are in the middle 
of some perilous times. We're in the middle of war and whatever happens, whatever happens in your life, whatever happens in your family, whatever happens in our nation, whatever happens all around us, we have to stay on mission and do what Paul told us through the spirit and the inspiration of God to rejoice in the Lord. You know, that word rejoice is very, very key and it's very integral because we got to recognize rejoicing re means to do again. Joy means to be filled with joy. It reminds me of what was written of Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he did what? Endured the cross, despised the shame, and he sets down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why is that so important? Because I believe that in this time, we as believers have to stay on focus. We have to stay on mission when it comes down to rejoicing in the Lord. You know, I'm so grateful that he put the Lord there because Lord means owner, Lord means master, Lord means ruler. The one who we have truly submitted our lives unto. And in essence, what Paul is telling us is that whatever happens in our lives, understand that we can rejoice that we have an owner, that we have a master, that we have a ruler that is our very present help in the time of trouble. You know, whatever's going on in your world right now, God is a very present help. Whatever is going on in your health right now, God is a very present help. Whatever's going on in the nation right now, God is our very present help. So whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, let us continue to rejoice in the Lord, who is our banner, who's our peace, who's our provider, who's our protection, and who's positioned as the Lord of our lives. What a gift to be encouraged and challenged tonight through these leaders as they've helped us consider ways the calls to a church 2,000 years ago land both prophetically and practically in our current communities and reality. I can tell you how grateful I am as now a longtime pastor in OC to partner with men and women like this who care deeply, not just about their own churches, but the collective, united, dependent church of our county. And God is bringing us together and raising us up for such a time as this to showcase peace in the midst of anxiety, humility in the midst of hostility, and trust that whoever sits in the White House, there is an infinitely greater seat of power that Jesus has been exalted to once and for all. And we know we are hopeless and helpless without him, which is why we pray. So let's do that now. The Zoom link is in the chat window. Join me, Pastor Sheridan, and many other of these leaders in an hour of praying for our county and each other together. Stay tuned on seekweek.org for a full Seek Week that's coming in early 2021. We would love your prayer and your financial partnership in helping more of these moments and gatherings come together. For now, let me transition to Zoom with Paul's last words in his letter to the Philippians as translated in the message. Receive and experience the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, deep, deep within yourselves. Amen. And now, let's pray.